Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm super, super happy to be talking today with Rafram Shadad and Laila Gohar, uh, two, two great persons that, and artists uh, that I'm a huge fan of um, and that I think I share many um, interests with. Um, thank you, Interval, for bringing us together. I'm just going to give a few words about Interval to present the platform who invited us to do this talk. So Interval is a nonprofit collective that was created on Zoom during lockdown um, and founded by Amina Dabish, Usama Agarti, Hamza Slewi, and Omar Ben Musa uh, in the attempt to expand the access to art, to support up and coming artists and to engage young audiences more deeply in conversations surrounding uh, culture and identity. And more importantly, Interval hopes to become a common voice for um, Arabs and Africans on the art scene. Um, so I want to first um, ask Leila and Rafram to introduce themselves. Uh, maybe we can start with you, Leila, if you want to say a few words about, you know, where you come from, you were born in Cairo and how you evolved from there to New York and how you got into food in the first place. Sure. So I was born in Cairo, Egypt, and I lived there. I went to school there as a child, and I was raised there. And then I moved to the United States when I was around 18 years old. Um, I came here to go to school, uh, and I've, I, did several, I did several different degrees in, in my school. And um, I started cooking, basically, I mean, I think as a child... Um, I, I, I used to cook for my sister and I because I was not a big fan of the food that my mother made us. Uh, so it started off like that in a kind of very naive way. Um, and it, it sort of became this ritual that my sister and I would do. Um, and then it kind of continued in my life as I moved to the United States. It became uh, what I did uh, sort of for side work in the beginning and on a social level. Um, uh, because I, um, you know, used food as a tool for gathering and for bringing people together. Um, and because I um, sort of had been wanting the kind of food that I grew up with, which was not necessarily Egyptian food. Um, I kind of, you know, people often ask me like, oh, do you cook Egyptian food? I don't really think there is like such a thing as just like pigeonholing Egyptian food. Egyptian food is a result of evolutions of peoples of time uh, that pass through a place. For me, I identify most with being Mediterranean. So it was more kind of that style of cooking. 
uh, that I missed when I moved to America. So I started cooking for myself and my friends socially um, and have not stopped since then. Yeah, I, I, was, I was actually wondering if you, if at some point you had um, studied art also, because there's also an interaction in what you do between food and art somehow. Yeah, when I moved to um, New York, which was like about eight years ago, I went to Parsons, which is an art school here in New York and um, studied several different things there. And I think, um, I don't know if uh, Usama wants to put some images, but uh, basically what you do now on top of the, of the social, of cooking socially for your friends is um, also using food as both an artistic medium and a tool for communication. Um, that's mine actually. Yep. Oh yeah, that's, oh yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, that's that's one thing that you did at um, Galerie Lafayette last year, I remember. Uh, it seems like another lifetime. Um, and you, you kind of explore the, the nature of human interactions by creating very convivial and multi-sensory edible events, actually. Um, and at the same time, you draw upon kind of historic methods of food preparation, uh, which sort of guide you towards digging into food's role in, in society. Um, yeah, these are, these are really, and it, it's pretty, what's interesting is that installations uh, can really vary a lot uh, from, one, from one event to the other. Uh, before we go more into that, uh, I would love to hear from you, Rafram. Um, you were born in Djerba, a small island in the south of Tunisia, and then you grew up in Jerusalem. Uh, where I think you studied photography, right? Yeah, visual arts mostly. Um, yeah, in a, in a photography school. And um, since 2004, um, I basically worked in Europe mostly. Um, and I actually engaged with food very late. I didn't, I was not a good, um, good, I mean, I was not eating very well. When I was a kid, I didn't like couscous. I didn't like anything that was, there was the pkela, which was like disgusting smell for me. I was um, escaping the kitchen. And, uh, and actually with the art practice, I, I started to go to trace uh, mostly like craft of my grandfather who had a printing house. And my father was a watchmaker. And, and I started to trace craft of, of my family and just go deep inside it. And, and eventually also ended up with like going back to my mother and, and check my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, all kinds of like rituals that happening in the kitchen and that nobody's talking about and people like assume it's part of like daily life. But it's also uh, for me, it was very interesting to isolate a moment or a second in, uh, in a preparation and, and, and exhibit it and, and show it to people to, to raise questions basically about stuff. And, uh, and um, eventually it started to be very deep. I mean, the research and, 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 and everything around it. Yeah, I feel, like, um, I feel like there is an idea in what you do. Maybe it stemmed from your very personal family kitchen, but then it went into uh, subjects of food politics and food power and with a particular interest in uh, the Jewish Arab cuisine of North Africa. Um, I feel like um, you sort of, you're engaging with many subjects that go from, you know, um, cultural food appropriation to, uh, to geographical um, colonization through food almost. Yeah, of course, like, because I grew up in Jerusalem and I was also a big part of like, of the, of the culinary talk there. Uh, I, was, I was running a, the a slow food in Israel for, for more than 10 years. Um, and I was part of many discussions and I saw how with the, uprising fashion of Mediterranean diet all over the world. Uh, food that was considered to be low and bad and oily, like the food of where I come from, uh, became suddenly uh, a fashionable food and food that people actually say it's belonged to them. Like people who were against this food, basically, and they were laughing and mocking the food. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember that clearly. Um, this food became more sexy and more like interesting. And, and of course, and if you talk about Israel and Palestine, it's not only about that, it's also about, it's something more deep about like, let's say like the, the, the Jews from the Arab countries, basically that's, um, and what's happening there is more, more deep because 
many Israelis believe that Jews from Arab countries are now Israelis and their history do not exist anymore. Um, and uh, they can use their history. I mean, they will never say pasta is Israeli, but they will say shakshuka or kubbe or things that are coming from with Jews. And it's connected to how people see history or other people's stories. And, um, and that's where I started actually to, to put a bit like, uh, try to understand all kinds of like processes that push the politics to fashion to, to many things. It's very, very easy and very straightforward to see how, for example, Minister of Foreign Affairs putting lots of money to, to promote Israeli food, but this Israeli food will always be something from uh, all, all Palestinian or Jewish from Arab countries. And this is something I'm working on a lot. Yeah, I remember you wrote an article called uh, How Shakshuka and Other Middle Eastern Dishes Turned into Iconic Israeli Foods. Uh, and I feel like there are, there are many examples of things that have been sort of appropriated from the Jewish Arab culture, uh, which is also the same as Arab culture, like Jews and Arabs in Tunisia used to eat basically the same thing. So then it traveled through, you know, through like through, front, through frontiers um, and became Israeli by means of marketing and communication. Yeah, it's like a process of nationalism of food. I mean, um, I'm going to talk about it later about like a project I'm doing with like uh, the, the region, but this kind of nationalization, nationalization of food, it's actually never, never treated food in a way. I mean, when I eat brick in Tunis, I mean, I get stories from Andalusian, from Ottoman, from from Sicilian because there's ricotta inside. It's like, it's amazing stories and, and, and things that actually uh, fulfill. I mean, this is actually where we live. We live in, a, in an area, in a region, in a planet, not in a, we are not, uh, we are not walking by the flag. You can see it in Italian food, of course. Yeah. Um, Leila, I wanted to ask you another question about uh, the way you use uh, food as, a, as an actual physical material and how maybe hear more about your process and wh when you work like very professionally not for um, social dinners yeah. like, how do you combine you know what you want it to look like with what you want it to taste because it's two things that sometimes don't necessarily go together and I feel like you make them convert so I would love to hear about your process your choice of ingredients and products um, and how you work on, a, on an event. For me, I, uh, I, I think of food as a material, you know, in, in my case, in this period of my life, it happens to be food. And I can see that evolving maybe into different things later in my life. But for the moment, it is the thing that I'm most interested in. So it's, it's the material that I use. Uh, I, tend, I tend to uh, be drawn towards very humble ingredients. Um, things like potatoes and rice and stuff like that. I'm not so interested in working with like um, caviar or like expensive kinds of things. I'm more drawn just to humble vegetables. Um, and um, yeah, for I, 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 most of my work professionally happens in spaces that can be a little bit contested or um, cold, you know, whether it's like a um, gallery opening or a museum or something like that these are these tend to be spaces that can be a little bit alienated alienating um and i enjoy very much to bring my work to spaces like that because it acts kind of like an it um it, i use the work to create this moment that acts kind of like an instant icebreaker you know people walk in and they're kind of not sure what to say in the beginning and they don't want to say something that makes them seem like they don't know what they're talking about but then suddenly you see this thing and it looks like uh not necessarily something that you've seen before or maybe something that you've seen before but sort of reimagined in a different way in the setting and it makes people um open up in a way sort of like like children you know, they're like, oh, what is that? Wow. You know, and, and people talk with one another and everyone sort of is kind of confused a little bit sometimes. And I, I really enjoy that to see to see that moment and people um, become become much more open and kind of forget about, you know, having to impress one another or that they're in the space. Uh, it's a little bit like um Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was, I was, I was going to say that there's something like <laughs> that's really about entertainment in the real sense of entertaining, like even um, almost as if you go to a, 
uh, how do you call that? Um, like Disneyland almost, you know, like a, like a magical effect of wow. And like brings you to your, to your childlike self. Um, yeah, there's kind of that performative moment that I, um, that I really enjoy. I find that people are much more able to connect with one another in that state. Um, and then, yeah, being able to do the work in those kinds of settings, I think, um, yeah, it, it's important for me. Mm. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it's not, um, when you were talking about the, the choice of very simple like, ingredients, uh, in comparison to Rafram, you don't necessarily, um, you don't necessarily tie your practice to a specific geographical area. You were saying earlier, you, um, you're sort of come from Mediterranean food, but when you work, you don't like that, that doesn't come into play necessarily. Right. Um, not necessarily. I, I, I often get, um, kind of like sucked in or interested in, um, not necessarily like a, a national cuisine, but more like an, a, an aspect of something that I stumbled, like, for example, right now, I've been doing a lot of reading on um, it, it, something that translates from Spanish to English as spoon food. And it's a part of, you can call it Spanish cuisine, but kind of an amalgamation of many other things that came before it, that all the food is eaten with a spoon. Um, so I kind of like do these deep dives into things like that, find some little hole yeah. that I'm interested in and go inside. But it's less like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to think about products that are from here or food or recipes yeah. from there. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Rafram, I would love for you to, um, to talk a little bit more about uh, maybe the, your project, The Leftovers. Um, which is a book that you're working on um, currently, but it's, I want you to talk about it because I feel like it summarizes quite well your, um, your research as a whole uh, over the region and like your past years of, of work. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a book, first of all, so it's very different from uh, what I did. What I did. Um, and the idea in the book is in a way uh, we, talking about food, but not in the terms that we use to today. We have this thing of North African cuisine, which of course is, uh, is, is not exist because North Africa is a big, uh, can, is a big area and we have different uh, politics of tomatoes by the Ottoman that didn't happen in Morocco. And we have, uh, of course, the MENA region, which is like North Africa and Middle East. Also people think Tunis is, is close to Baghdad and uh, especially Americans. And, uh, and we, I try a bit to, to, to melt a bit this region. And, and, and this project is about, in a way, walking around the post-Ottoman area. It's called the leftovers of the Ottoman Empire. Not talking about the Ottomans, of course, uh, but talking about the, the autonomies that used to be under the Ottoman uh, rule and see how food was in the, uh, changing between the cities, basically. Between the cities, because countries were a different idea back then, of course, and uh, mm -hmm. and that's how also I can see Jerusalem in a very easier easiest way than uh, today. Um, and it's basically a trip between Saloniki in, in Greece and going to Istanbul and Gaziantep and Aleppo, Halab, Beirut, Jerusalem, Cairo, uh, Tripoli, Tunis, and Algiers, and to check all kinds of recipes and and food items and food techniques that connected, and to to see the social level, the political level, the, all the levels that interesting for me, uh, how they react to each other and why brick became a thing here and in Istanbul, no. Uh, and what's the connection to the climate, what's connection to how multicultural a city was, a port city. Uh, and of course the, the political reasons of the Ottomans, how they push tomatoes, how they push coffee and all this stuff are, are interesting. And this project is basically talking about three continents uh, which is like Europe and Asia and Africa, uh, about a uh, few religions, uh, not only Jewish, Islam and Christianity, but man, all the mixture that's happening around um, and trying to break as much as possible every definition and go back regionally as possible uh, with uh, mostly like uh, portraits, faces, skin tone, everything and, and some food, uh, food making. Yeah, that's interesting because it also breaks the breaks the purely geographical approach. And 
there's something interesting in what you just said and something actually which ties back to uh, something that you also, Leila, talk about, which is port food. Uh, like cities that are ports have a specific way of uh, cooking or preparing and there's something that's kind of tying them um, tying them together so it's not only about like south of the Mediterranean but, or north of the Mediterranean but sometimes like being in a port like Tanger you might find stuff that's similar to Marseille or um, to another port in the in the Mediterranean and um, I, feel, I feel like your book of, um, is, sorry of course, spices routes were from Africa to all the spice routes were during the uh, via the ports mostly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, Laila, is that something? Uh, is that something that you're interested in? The like cuisine of ports and transit somehow. Yeah, I think that there's an energy around port cities uh, that, f for me, I feel really attracted to that and kind of at home there because um, it's so transient. Mm -hmm. Everyone, you know, and of course there's the, the spice trades and everything that all the goods that come in and come out of there, but also there's this mixture of the people that nobody's really from there. You know, everyone had kind of, their father arrived from there via whatever because he was on a boat and the mother like that, those are, and. So I feel re I identify with that a lot I, because I, ne I never had any kind of, I don't really identify with any sense of nationalism or like a flag. I don't feel anything when I see any kind of flag and it kind of, it, 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 it bewilders me a little bit when people do. I, I, it, I just find it hard to identify with. And um, in poor cities, there's this kind of transience that everybody's a stranger. And so every, yeah. at the same time, everybody's at home. Yeah, yeah, and I think of course it has it, the effect on food. Also, there's kind of this um, slightly like um, deviant kind of way because a lot of drugs pass through. So every mm -hmm. it's kind of this like people live a little bit on the edge in this way that, um, but at the same on the edge, but at the same time in a harmony that yeah. I think is um, affects all aspects of life and food being you know one of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I also want to bring up something that um, is present in, in both of your practices in, in a similar way somehow. Um, Rafram, I feel like your, your practice as an artist has to do with social engagement um, and with sort of, I mean, it's something that you deal with through food as well. And I feel like you both created sort of tight communities around the dinners that you throw. Uh, and I'm talking more about maybe your personal life or although Rafram, you have sort of two levels of um, throwing dinners. One is more personal at your home and one is more public and performative uh, in other spaces in Tunis. Um, we, can, we can start with those actually. We can talk about the dinners that you throw in Darben Gesem, which is um, an old house and hotel, I think, right? In the yeah. Medina, in the old town of Tunis. Yeah. Yeah, basically there and also like in, in I mean, it's also including about, we talk about the, the, the food, we talk about the history, and it's always very thematic, basically. And it's a bit different from, let's say, uh, something that happens in a gallery, because there is more like a sitting uh, menu and we sit down and, and and I come out and I, I talk about everything. And, and when I do it in a, in a different place, it's like in an in a art space, it's completely wearing uh, other customs. I mean, it's more like into engaging. And sometimes I ask people to do things and I, have, I give tasks to people if to peel an orange and to throw it or to do something that is connected to, uh, to they will feel part of, part of the, I mean, this white, white cube is all about like uh, putting something and, and look at it and, and showing to people. And when people, uh, visitors are being part of it, it's, it's very interesting. And, um, and this is very different from like dinners that are completely, completely organized. This is like very different two levels. But in both things, there are lots of thought between, behind. I mean, it's a, sometimes it's, it's like a burden even, you know, when I think that I need to talk about every dish, not only just put something. And, uh, uh, but this is something I chose to do basically, because this is something that really, really, I think missing now, I mean, uh, in this kind of like instant, fast uh, culture of food today. 
Um, the, yeah, there's something quite performative uh, about it, right? Like, yeah, yeah, sure. even in terms of you, you know, uh, there's something pedagogical almost. You're, you're sort of um, teaching or performing or like, you know, taking, a, taking on a persona of, uh, of a storyteller around the field. Yeah, yeah, I need to be a, sto I need to be a storyteller. It's a bit like, like also in, 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 the, in the art scene. It's all about st story behind it and, 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 and just make people feel that they don't just eat. And yeah. It and it's... I guess it's also, um, I guess it's, it's a little bit similar in the, more, in the smaller dinners that you have at your house because uh, you also take a lot of time to explain, you know, why you chose certain ingredients, why these ingredients go together, how, where did you pick up your fish and like, why are you putting so this, this, like this thing and this thing? Yeah, it is super interesting. I mean, now we, had, now we are in COVID, so it's very, everything is super clear about the fish, I mean, I live on the sea and the fish is coming and there's seasons for the fish and there is a weight. My mother need, my mother always tell me you need to eat grouper only when it's 11 kilo. Yeah. If it's 10 kilo, it's a sardine. It's not grouper, it's different fish. And there is like the, 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 the caroos, the sea bass of La Goulette, which is different. And you have the figs, that the black figs that are coming. And everything is, of course, have so many meanings. and. And it's, it's, I think it's amazing to understand this kind of stuff when we eat. I don't know why I do it actually, because many years ago I didn't care anything about it, but, but while I'm going through also uh, for the craft and respecting actually this kind of like walks of fishing and, and, and traditions and stories, I, I, I always gradually understand the, the, the meaning of why also I really like eager to say, to talk about it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Laila, similarly, I feel like your New York apartment, although it's the size of a New York apartment, so it's not like a huge, but you've been hosting so many um, dinners for your friends, uh, either friends from New York or friends passing by, or, um, and, and I feel like um, on the one hand, it's um, very different from the edible installations that you conceive for work. Like the way that you cook at home is, is very homey. Like it, it feels extremely um, cozy in a way. And through that, it seems that I feel like you're creating new narrative. You're sort of building ties between people and, uh, and sort of unfolding human histories. Because I'm, I'm sure many things are born out of those um, dinners, you know, either relationships between people or, or even more. Yeah, I, it's something that I, I think I, I do very naturally, but I've been doing it for a while. So I guess it recently, and also because of, in light of COVID and how things have changed, I've been thinking about it more um, and kind of reflecting on why I do this. But for me, it's, um, it's important to have a space that I can share with other people. Um, and New York does have that kind of transient feeling related to, to what we were talking about in port cities. It's obviously very different than like Tanger or Marseille or whatever, yeah. but um, it does have this feeling of like people coming and going and kind of passing by. So I, it's, I feel like my apartment is a bit of like a refuge, like somewhere where you can stop for a moment on your way to wherever you're going. Um, and it just happens very organically. The way that I cook here is kind of how I cook for myself, like when I just need to eat and it tends to be very simple. Um, a lot of vegetables and fish and things that I can get from the market, Union Square Market, which I go to a couple of times a week. Um, and um, yeah, it's kind of like a revolving cast of characters. Some people are make um, repeated appearances <laughs> like my closest friends and then there's people passing by I, I do actually spend some time it comes together very naturally but I actually do spend some time putting together um, who's coming on, on you know it happens maybe once a week or sometimes twice a week and um, I kind of think of people in two categories there's what I think of as characters and then there's glue characters <laughs> are are big personalities people that kind of can tend, up, can tend to take up some space, but are also very entertaining and charming and kind of performative. Um, and, and then there's glue, which are people that are very good at listening and making others feel comfortable and kind of putting people 
uh, at ease in a way. And I think that you need a balance of both. If you have too many characters, it can get overwhelming and they start to get competitive. And if you have too much glue, it can be a little bit boring. Yeah. Um, so I think about this a lot and how, you know, people come together in this space. And I don't see myself, I, I was talking about this with a friend recently and she said, oh, are you a character or a glue? And I don't think that I fall within that. I'm kind of, sep I'm more like, um, I'm separated. I try to be, I'm very present and, you know, of course when it's happening, but I don't like to uh, take up so much room myself. Yeah. I, I, it's more kind of like creating the space and then not being invisible because I'm very much there, but, um, you know, you, you, you kind of plant the seeds and then you just kind of stand back and like allow for it to happen. Yeah. I, I get kind of, I, I mean, I never like speak or anything when it's just like people at my house, but sometimes I have to do it for work because I'm asked and I tend to get very uncomfortable. I'm not, I don't really think I'm good at it. I'm quite shy when it comes to that kind of thing. And, and my hope for any of these kinds of things is that the work speaks for itself. And if, if it doesn't, that's totally okay. If someone leaves their feeling something, then great. Um, but you know, sometimes you have to, and I understand it's like part of the game. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You're like, at home, you're like the director who like put together a set. Yeah, I feel like, a, yeah, like a, yeah, like a composer or something. And you have yeah. all these like notes, these different elements, and then you just put them and then that's it. You just kind of stand back and like allow for it to happen. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Yeah, I, I, I wish it's true that the recent period really made us revalue those. I mean, I, I personally val always valued this, those moments, but right now it's like um, something that's truly missed, that gathering. And, and it's true that, as you were saying, we're, I, I'm also personally reflecting on why are we gathering? You know, why do we gather and what's the pleasure that comes out of that? And it's, it's, it's pretty... Um, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's missing from our lives right now. Um, and something, something that's related to that maybe, and something that you, you also share, um, both of you, uh, even though you live in diametrically opposed places, New York and Tunis, like I couldn't think of two cities that are more different than that. Um, but somehow you are both kind of advocates of a slow paced life, um, Rafram, I believe your choice of Tunis as a base was, um, I mean, you don't have a choice but to slow down, actually. Um, you, you mentioned in the um, Apartamento video interview uh, that life in Tunisia is different from anything that you knew before and it, that it gave you a different perspective on life. And so I was wondering what you meant about that exactly, and especially when you talk about being in a different mental time zone. Yeah, I mean... When I, just, when I came back to Tunis, when it's five years ago, it was a bit of a shock in the beginning um, to understand that everything is different, basically. The, um, the West, as, as I knew it, was uh, changing and, uh, and I came to a third world, basically. Uh, but then I just learned the benefits of a third world and, and how you adjust to it. Uh, um, and, and of course, during COVID, it's, it's a third world become a first world and the opposite because then you have everything around you. Uh, but also like after a year, I think it took me a year to start to understand what's happening around me and, and what kind of like, how should I live now? I mean, how should I, I need to change my, the way I live, the way I eat, the way I travel and everything so it can fit. And I, I don't think I ever been in a, in a city more than two, three years in a row. I mean, and Tunis have been like almost five years because it, it's, it's really like, it's, I mean, I feel like I'm also like very old also in a way here because it's, because every, many people come here to, to die basically, like many Tunisians who move to France, they come back here to, to sit in a cafe and watch the sea. And, and, and when you live here as, as a young, I don't know, I'm not very young anymore, but if you live here as a young, I mean, it's, it's, it's a different state of life. And, uh, and you basically change. It's like, um, it's a different aesthetics, it's different. Everything is super different. I mean, I don't have everything all the year, fruits, vegetables. Um, I live in a four season area, which is different from many, many places I've been. It's not too cold, it's not too hot. It's always like the balance. Uh, I get things directly from the market, from people, from the fishermen, from the farmers, uh, without even going to like, without even making an effort because that's the only choice basically. There's not a choice. And, um, 
and you get used to it. And once you get used to it, you, you start to love it. And, and I, I found out that when I lived in Tunis, even for a week, even to Italy, I just been to Italy, which is similar, of course, it's the same region. I really miss Tunis because something in it like very, very addictive. And um, yeah, I think I think you get used to the get you inside, and it's very hard to 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 make it again. I mean, it's like really hard to live it again anywhere in the world. Yeah, you get used to the pace, which is very particular. And I, I agree with you that uh, it's a city that forces you to slow down. Like you, you can you can do like you can do one thing a day, uh, and it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. a lot. Like in, in New York, I mean, I, I, when he was there now, it was like 10 meetings a day, you know, 10 things, and then back to back, and then you sit in a coffee and you wait for another one, another one. And here it's like once a day, yeah. and it's cancelled. <laughs> because, that's it, because that's what you do. I mean, it's like, you can't do two things a day. You, you get exhausted so fast, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like lots of, you're saying that, old people uh, go back to Tunis, but I feel like more and more young people want, want to come back and actually are coming back or settling. And also foreign people who are, you know, living in Tunis and sort of um, creating a change in the cultural life too. There is something that's shifting right now. Uh, and maybe you're part of those people, you know, because you moved back four years ago as well. So there must have been like a, I mean, for you it's different, I guess, because you were born there and it's your country, but there, I feel like there is a new attraction maybe for that kind of, um, of life, you know, like getting out of the, of the centers and moving into something like that. Also because Tunisia has changed a lot in terms of tourism, you know, there, we don't have the big buses of German tourists anymore. Like we used to before with like this mass European tourism. Now it's getting more and more like boutique and like charming and like craft oriented yeah, and food oriented. Really cool. yeah. It's happening all over the world and Tunis is uh... Is, is going slow towards there. It's not fast like other, other places no. in the world, but it's, it's going there because basically it is. I mean, if you talk about boutique, uh, if it's crafts of Sejnen or, uh, or all kinds of uh, food that produced here and, uh, and, the, and the private beaches and all the secret places on the beach, all the things were exist like for, for thousands of years. That's the reason why all civilization was started, was developing in this region. Uh, but because Tunis is categorized as, uh, as the Arab world, basically, it was make people, of course, fear and, and think that we don't have, of course, people think about camels when they think about Tunis. And, and this thing's changing, of course, because of internet, because of, uh, also because the world is going into, into more like, uh, uh, let's say organic, let's say uh, handmade stuff. And Tunis is, is, is by default, uh, I mean, this is like what we do here. I mean, yeah, that, that makes sense. And um, Laila, I mean, as I was saying, New York for me is, the, is literally the opposite of all of that. Um, but somehow I have the feeling that uh, the way that you approach food and you approach cooking um, really relates to this notion of slow pace or like of having time or really taking the time and like using sort of low tech methods to achieve something. Uh, in, in lots of your, like so lots of your recipes have been very comforting during lockdown to just make, you know, food, things that you posted on Instagram. And a lot of them really required to sit down, uh, prepare stuff for a long time, let it cook for a long time. I feel like you're also an advocate of that type of Thing. How, how does that work in a city that's uh, super, super fast-paced? Yeah, I mean, for obvious reasons, New York is the exact opposite of what Rafram was describing in Tunisia in, in, in terms of people's notion of time. Everybody's on the go and the city rushes you uh, very much. And so I think you have to create that space from inside you as opposed to like somewhere like Tunis where it's kind of external, you know, everyone mm -hmm. takes their time. Here it's more like you have to, at least for me, I have to kind of create that pace. Otherwise I, I would feel like trampled, kind of run mm -hmm. over. Um, so that's why for me, it's especially important to do that kind of thing here. And um, I think in, in, recent, in recent times because of COVID people have really been uh, reassessing their concept of time because we don't have more time now than before COVID. I mean, there's always 24 hours in the day, no matter COVID, this, that, whatever, in Tunis, here, there. But it's more like your priorities and what you decide to do with that time. 
And for a long time, I think we became kind of obsessed with this idea of convenience, convenience, fast this, fast food, fast that. Um, and I think there's been kind of a shift here in terms of what, what does it really mean convenience? What is like the luxury of time when you have time to do what exactly? Um, for me, it's always been, time has always been um, the, the, the most, um, I mean, at least in terms of cooking, the thing that I think about most in terms of cooking. Um, because so many other things you can kind of like play around with or change or whatever, but time is really a constant thing that's like at the core of everything um, in, for food. Yeah. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how I'm gonna spend my time. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, it's, and it's, it's funny because through, through those things that you were, um, through those recipes basically, uh, they took lots of time to realize. I, I started to understand the concept of your inner time or that, like that time that you carve for yourself in another, when, when things are fast paced or, or something like that. It, it, it's really, it changes your, your rhythm somehow. And it's, it's quite interesting. Um, maybe before we start taking questions, uh, I wanted to ask you both about uh, your current projects or future projects, although everything is sort of on standby right now, but what are you thinking about? What are you working on uh, these days? I can start. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, besides, besides the book project, I'm working now on, on a project with, connected to India also. It started a bit as a spice trailer because it was like, I found out that it's like six, seven century. There was like uh, many people going from Sus and Madia to, to South India and there was like spices exchange. And of course, I work on the fashion level of Sari and Saksari and all things that came back from India to Tunis. And, um, and I do some lots of research about it. And I hope basically that things will be open a bit so we can move a bit and travel and do some research. and. Um, and that's, that's basically I mean, what I do. I mean, I'm waiting because there are a few projects yeah. that were like housed because of, uh, because of what's happening now. So the, it's, like, it's tied to the project of the book, of the leftovers? No, no, this is an, another thing, basically. It's, uh, okay. it's like a fashion project and, and also like a bit of food, but mostly fashion. What about you, Leila? I'm working on a couple of different things. Uh, one is actually a book as well which is kind of coming together. It's been a lot of years that I have been kind of um, toying with the idea of doing it or not doing it or waiting. So finally I've started to write some things down and we'll see what happens, but it is coming together. And um, a second thing is a show that I'm working on with a friend of mine called Sam Stewart. And um, Sam is an artist and designs a lot of um, kind of furniture but it's not it's functional kind of art it's not exactly furniture and he designed a lot of things in my apartment um and i um i'm i i've it's one of the things that covid has been made has made me think about as well is my material possessions in this world and what i own and how i'm attached to them and this kind of prescribed value that we associate to things and it, i was feeling in the in very claustrophobic that all of my things were taking up all of my space, especially when I couldn't leave my space. So I decided at one point that I wanted to get rid of everything that I own. And um, I mean, it sounds very radical when I say it like that, not absolutely everything, but a large percentage of what I own. So I'm doing this show um, outside of my studio, basically on the sidewalk where Sam and I are um, designing some like displays and then putting all the things that I own in these little formations. Um, in groups of objects and I wanted to sell everything for the same value so basically have mm -hmm. it so that you have to buy like you know let's say everything is ten dollars so the paper clip is ten dollars but also some valuable like piece of whatever is ten dollars mm -hmm. but I thought you know of course nobody's gonna buy the things that have no supposed value so now we're grouping them in little families of objects and you have to buy the whole pot so there's okay. like five things, let's say, and the, you know, there's every, all, every pot is the same price and you have to buy the whole thing. Um, and we're doing these kind of displays uh, with the, it's kind of like these collage kind of things that are going to go on the floor um, with the kind of um, still lives of objects around them. Oh, wow. So I'm looking forward to that. And 
Are, what but else am I doing? Is it, wait, is it, um, is it a kind of, uh, you know, you don't want to own anything anymore in a way? Like, is it a... I just, a it's, I mean, it's a very idealistic, for, I feel like it's very idealistic for me to say I don't want to own anything anymore. But for the moment, I feel like I need to um, kind of separate myself with all of these kind of things that I accumulate. Yeah. I, I'm feeling a little bit claustrophobic by them. Like, for example, I'm also moving apartment. I, I really love my apartment. And like you were saying, I have a lot of, so it's a very tiny apartment, but I, it, it has become, it has come to feel like the home of so many people, which for me is like the greatest thing. But uh, that being said, I kind of, I don't know, I, with, every, with what has happened recently, I feel like I need just empty, more empty space and new space and not so many uh, material attachments. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to take a few questions here. Um, -na 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 -na. So maybe, um, what advice would you give to someone that enjoys food, the process and how food gathers people, but is intimidated because they have no professional culinary experience? Rafram, you go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, I mean, I didn't study to, how to cook and, and I was afraid of food, not, not afraid, I just was not interested. But once you are interested in food, generally interested, and you just you want to cook something that you like, or even you ate and you want to repeat it, and you do a bit of research about where it comes from and how it's cooked and what's, that, what's the options, because there are many, many rules that were actually invented before we, before we were born, I mean, like, you cook a potato, you, 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 you put the chickpeas in the night so the poison will go out. There are many, many things that once we start to go inside a bit to, to everything, it's very, very easy. It's one of the easiest craft because you can always taste, you can always smell, you can know if you arrive to what you want. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I don't think it's require a lot of like uh, knowledge. It's uh, very, very specific. And uh, once you do a bit of research about things, and of course we have online and we have people, we have friends, we have the people you buy from, the vegetable, the people you buy from the fish, usually they know a bit more. Um, it's very, very easy. And it's like one of, I think it's very easy because it's very easy to know that it, it worked out. It's very, you know, it's very, if it's satisfying you, it's, you're always already there. I agree with that. I think that, you know, we all have kind of what we call common sense. We have senses, you can smell, you can taste, you can touch. But because again of this kind of culture of convenience, we we are forgotten a little bit about that. We forgot that like you have to smell a vegetable. If it doesn't smell like anything, likely it will not taste like anything. And I think if you if you rely on your senses, then you you're already at a huge advantage. Um, and if you have a little bit of curiosity and if you enjoy cooking, then there's absolutely nothing to stop you. If you don't enjoy it and it becomes a burden, then my advice would be just don't do it. Leave it for people that enjoy it uh, because there's no reason for that to feel like a chore. But um, yeah, I would say just visit your any mar you know, markets around you. Speak to the people that are selling you what, you know, the, the people in the market stands. Those people are very knowledgeable. They're often the farmers themselves and they love when people ask questions and they love to talk about the things that they're growing. Same goes for fishmongers or butchers. Um, and yeah, I think if you're curious and if you use your senses, then that's, you're good. Thanks. There's um, a question for you, Laila. Uh, someone who's saying, Elizabeth, who's saying, I really, I really responded to your comment about being like a musical composer. I also loved your installation for Bang & Olufsen where you united sound and taste. Does the sound or vibe of the port cities you've lived in or described inspire or influence this interest? So basically the, the soundscape around your, um, around your work. Yeah, I think a lot about the sounds of different cities. Like, for example, my mom lives in Istanbul, and I think Istanbul has a really particular sound um, because of those, um, I forgot how you call them in English, those big boats that, um, that cargo things. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I do spend a lot of time thinking about the different soundscapes of the cities, and I think there is definitely a parallel between that 
and the way that people eat and how food is sold, like whether it's markets and um, stuff like that. Cool. Um, a question for Rafram. Uh, were you able to trace the roots of Turkish coffee? Is it Serbian, Greek, Bosnian, or Arab? No, I mean, like many things, there's not even one answer to, to this. I mean, uh, we, we, we believe it's Arab, of course, from Yemen, and, but, but we don't know exactly. I mean, I, mean I, didn't, I didn't do a big research. I'm working with a researcher of Ottoman Empire for that, but it's... Uh, we don't, we, there's never like one, one place where it was like they put the water and the, fi and the fire and it happened. Yeah. Um, there is a question for both of you. Uh, when you are planning your events, do you consider food waste and or accessibility for guests financially? If so, how? Um, I often feel guilty working in the hospitality space. Um. I can answer very fast. Um, usually, usually I try to cook everything. Basically, if I have also, I use the stems. I use everything basically for other dishes, and and usually because it's seasonal, so it's always very very good. All the structure of of the fruit, or and if there's a peel, I can I can dry it, and and um, and sometimes I do like uh, like private dinners, and sometimes I do like uh, events that are completely public and in spaces that are free and of course yeah for me too i i mean that sometimes there is leftover and i've been thinking much more seriously in the last year what to do with that and i found an organization in new york that takes a lot of that and redistributes it so that's been really great um and they redistribute the food to you know people in need of it um, and then the second part of your question, in terms of accessibility, that is also something that I've been thinking more about. And I have been doing um, events that are more um, open to the public and, and, and I've been doing more and more of that. Like what I described that I'm doing with my friends. That is I don't, I don't think guilt, I, don't, I mean, I think it's consciousness is important so much. Consciousness is very important in terms of food waste and what you're doing, but I don't, I think to have a, like guilt is kind of, it's like, for me, it's, um, I don't, I don't put my, my energy and guilt there, but it's more about consciousness and how to do the right, how to do the right thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like consciousness is a, is a right word to to be navigating this, um, this realm of food. Um, another question for both of you. In our current moment of separation, what does the future of gathering look like to you both? And how has it made either of you reimagine the ways in which to connect to others? <laughs> um, I can start. I think it's more important than ever right now to find ways to connect with each other in real life. Uh, I don't really think that Zoom uh, getting together is really getting together at all. Um, and I think it's kind of like funny as like a social experiment and it's, you know, what a lot of people are doing now. But for me, no, absolutely nothing replaces or will replace the physical space. And um, so it's just about navigating these times and figuring out how to create these spaces, whether it's outside or in ways that can, people can feel safe and um, you know, obviously doing it all in a responsible way, but I don't think, and I don't want to think, and if that is the future, like I don't want to go, <laughs> that our whole lives is going to be online and we're going to work online and socialize online and have dinner parties online. If, you know, if that's where everyone's going, <laughs> I'll wait right here. Yeah, for sure. I, I like that things are going outside, basically. That's what happened. Yeah, that's very cool. I like that too. Rooftop, uh, beach, uh, market. Like you go to a supermarket, you need to put your mask. But when you go in a market, which is open space, you don't put it. And people, of course, going to the market more than the supermarket. They're avoiding supermarkets now. They're going more to like Khadar vegetable guy that is outside. They don't go to buy things under 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 ceiling and they try to get more air. And this is something very, that's something good. I think that people will get used to it because it's much nicer. Yeah, the, in New York, there's been so much of that. Um, before we didn't really have 
very significant outdoor dining. I, I'm not really sure why, but I think it has a lot to do with uh, the city and what they license and they kind of make it prohibitively expensive for restaurants to do that. But now um, you can drink on the street, which used to be illegal. Or, or restaurants, the ones that have been able to reopen are all outdoors and it kind of makes New York feel like it has piazzas. Like people drinking and it's, it's really nice. Yeah, that must be, that must really change the city. Uh, it's, it, it seems quite incredible actually. Uh, a question for Rafra. Um, why did you decide to go back to Tunis? Is it a hard choice or political? Is the food a kind of line, a link to not feel cut? Um, first of all, I apologize that I'm in the darkness, but I like it. Like the, it's, very, it's like natural light. Here you are, yeah. That's a sunset. It's nice. Um, I mean, it was it was a bit political, of course, but also comfort. I mean, if I was born in Khartoum, I would not go back to Khartoum, but uh, because Tunis is very comfortable. But also, it was after a crisis in Germany where it was very very comfortable life and uh, like making out and very sponsored and very easy, but a bit depressing. Uh, I decided to move to a place that is more expressive. And uh, it was, first of all, I thought about South Italy and then the obvious uh, Tunis. So, um, and it's, uh, of course, everything I, I research and, 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 and learn, it's all here. So instead of like traveling here, I went to Baladia, I went to municipality, I, I signed a contract, I took a house here. Um, and suddenly I walking in the streets that I know very well from, from family and from uh, stories and, 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 and of course it was, uh, it was, it's a big difference for me. It's, it's still like I'm, today I walked in Hafsiya and I felt so weird also to walk there because there was this guy who said almond juice and I was there like 15 years ago. Um, and I went to this guy to get almond juice and it was all very, um, it still feels like a dream basically, but I'm five years here, so it's quite a lot. Yeah. Um, maybe one last question. Uh, maybe two last questions. One is, would you describe yourselves more, more as artists or as chefs or both? Uh, and the second question is, uh, do you have any key readings uh, for you through your relationship with food? I, I can start. Uh... Um, no, I, I'm definitely not a chef. I think chef for me is something completely different than my, I mean, chef need to be, to, to know how to run stuff, to run an organization, a, a place, a, a business. Um, I think there is something called uh, for level of satisfaction that you need to satisfy people. It's something completely different than what I do. I mean, I like to satisfy people. It's, it's nice to satisfy people, but I don't want to be dependent on that. Uh, and I work in, in, in mostly in visual arts. I mean, this is like the biggest frame of that. Um, Key readings, I don't know. I mean, I don't read a lot, like in the last years. I, don't, I, will, I want to read more, but, uh, but in food, I mean, I love, I love Claudia Roden, of course, she's an amazing uh, writer. And, and she did very, very, she's one of the big, most important researchers of this region, the Mediterranean region, the, the Arab world region, and the, the Jewish region, Jewish like uh, layer of this Arab world. And, and um, and I learned a lot from, from, from knowing her, from visiting her to reading her books. And, and this is something I recommend all the time. Well, what about you, Leila? I also don't really consider myself a chef. For me, a chef is uh, someone that um, works more in a traditional food space, like a restaurant, et cetera. Um, so that's the first part. And then if I were to recommend one book right now, I recently read um, the book ga called Garlic, Mint and Sweet Basil by Jean-Claude Izzo. I think it's, he writes a lot about the Mediterranean and that one specifically is about uh, Mediterranean identity and, and, you know, relating to what we were saying earlier about how when, when everyone is from somewhere else, no one is really home and therefore everyone is kind of home. Um, so, you know, yeah. And he describes the markets in a way that I think is very compelling. Great. That sounds great, actually. Um, well, thank you both so much. Um, I really hope next time we won't be on Zoom, but on Rafram's Terrace in Tunis. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking octopus on the canoe. 
Um, but in the meantime, be well. Thanks everyone for tuning in and for the questions. And thank you, Anterval, for having us. Um, bye. Thank Talk you. To you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Ciao, Lena. Ciao, Mia. Bye.